Hello. Hello. What's up? What, okay, what are you doing right now? What are you doing right now? A puzzle? What are you yeah. doing? Okay, well, it's, pieces. it's it's not puzzle time. It's podcast. Time. Oh, is that right now? Okay, I'll get on right now. Bye. Okay. All right. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Good. Oh yeah. Okay. What's going on? I'm ready. Okay. Uh, do you remember Passion Murray? I mean, first of all, the name Passion. Like, where do you get that? Is so great because yeah. I'm gonna find out whether she was maimed that or whether it was a, you know, she earned it. You know, like Janet Champ is a champ. Mm -hmm. Champion. Anyway, Passion. Yes, I think when we were in Detroit a long time ago, yeah. working um, with all those incredible people that were revitalizing. Detroit. She's yeah. part of that story. Um, yeah, she's but, very clever. I think that she'll be very interesting to hear what she's up to these days. Yeah. Uh, really looking forward to, to seeing her. She's she's more than clever. She's a leader. You know, she's a, she's leading a lot. Yeah, I agree. So, um, all right. You ready? Yep. Let's go. I have my, I did have a question before you got on, which, which I asked Jesse and he didn't know. Did, did you... Who named, did you, were you born with the name Passion or did you bring that name in? Yes, my dad named me that. And um, it's so crazy because at different stages of my life, it meant different things. In college, it meant a lot of crazy things. You can imagine when you're hanging out at a bar and right. guys are going, Passion? Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but from a spiritual standpoint, it's a it's a cool name to have, but uh, yeah, my dad named me that. <laughs> so interesting how people grow into their names. So now you have this unbelievable, like, like relentless passion for what you do. And my my, how did this come about? What's the evolution of this work? Yeah, so I think it's a it's a combination of things. Um, I grew up going to Mississippi to our family farm and. Just being fascinated, you know, when you're a kid in the city, like a lot of us, and you go off into nature, you know, um, and there's all these inquisitive things going through your mind, or you, you become inquisitive. And my grandfather was such a serene and like, just a common, just say like, calm, cool and collective guy. He just, he could communicate with the animals. Um, he, just weather patterns like he knew he was in tune with nature and so that was fascinating and then i think part of the the evolution also is being in grand rapids which was a conservative city um a lot of i grew up with a lot of republicans who are dutch and christian reformed and most of my friends i love them to death they're good good folks uh but it was very conservative at home. And so the revolutionary moment for me is when I returned to Grand Rapids in like 2003, 2004, I lived in Houston. I attended school down in Houston. And when I, when I arrived back in Grand Rapids, they were basically strategizing on how to build the city more efficiently. So the green building chapter was there. Uh, there were a lot of folks who were involved in the climate movement at home, and it was fascinating. And so I kind of got invited. Well, I did get invited. One of my friend's dads was running this uh, organization called Associated Builders Contractors. And John said, Passion, why don't you come and learn a little bit about sustainability and the future? And so that, and then when I look back on the trips to the landfills with my dad, having a contracting business, it was like, you know, all of those things uh, basically had something to do with who I am today. Um, we're already rolling here, but this is Passion Murray, an incredible environmental activist, um, so many things, Detroit Dirt, that's your foundation. And you are making noise and making changes around the world. And, you know, we're, we all are grateful and need you to be doing what you're doing. And we need people like you doing the work. Anything else you want to say about a little bit about yourself? I'm just grateful. You know, I'm always grateful to meet uh, folks like you who, who give a damn about, you know, the world and impact and you want to push this message. And, and for me, that's the most beautiful thing is 
aligning with like minds, uh, the meeting of the minds, that is to me what is going to move the ball up the court, what will shift for the future for future generations. But um, I talk about myself all the time. So I, you know, <laughs> there's not, there's not much more to say other than I love the environment. And I hope that uh, tons of young people around the world start taking a position within the climate movement. That's Did you my hope. <laughs> Did you have a, um, a, a feeling about the environment before you went to your first landfill? Um, no, it was after, well, yes, in the sense of being, loving the fact that I watched my grandfather and family members out on the land in Mississippi, that gave me some type of uh, spiritual feeling. But as far as like impact and, and what, what like confusion, and not quite understanding what was going on. That happened after the landfill. So what was it like the first time you went to the landfill? Like, you, did you have any idea what you were going to see? How old were you? And, you know, what did, did you have any idea what that was going to be? About third grade, I would say, somewhere up in there. Um, I know I wasn't quite in fourth grade. I want to say about, no, actually, it was like second grade. Because my dad, he had always had a crew of guys, but he um, was just as involved as they were. Cause he was, he actually was uh, still holding his position at GM and out in the field as well. Uh, but when I first went to the landfill, I had no idea because the fascination, a lot of my friends were more fascinated with what my dad was doing than I was. Than I was. They saw him drop me off in a dump truck one day and I told them, drop me off down the street. Like, don't pull me right up to the school. And some of the guys that I grew up with were like, man, that truck was sweet. And so that kind of changed things for me. Like, I was like, oh, okay, it was cool. But when I actually went to the landfill, it was mind boggling. Like I couldn't believe, it was just all of these birds flying around, all this waste everywhere. All these trucks were just dumping, you know, things. and. Every now and again, my dad would go to these sites and, and he would either let other people know or family members that there were things that people were discarding. And that's kind of the discovery. That's when it, when it hit me. Like I was asked, I was so inquisitive. I was asking him like, why, why were landfills ran the way that they were? I didn't really understand that. So is I, was, he, I would say about eight, nine years old. Is he still around? Yes. Yes. And and what does he think about the work that you're doing now? Oh, he, I mean, he loves it. He come, he's here at least every two weeks. Uh, they live about two and a half, three hours away. Uh, we're jumping in, you know, backhoes and, and bobcats together. I mean, he, he loves it. I mean, this was, he never saw this coming either. Like he couldn't have predicted this. Mm -hmm. um, we tried to work together. <laughs> We just weren't successful because we had two completely different missions and, and I, I was his little girl. So I don't think that he, at the time, like 20 years ago, when I was sharing my ideas, I don't think that he was so susceptible or accepting of the vision that I had. <laughs> um, you know, when you say he predicted it, what do you mean he predicted it? He thought you'd be doing this work? No, I was saying, I don't think that he would have predicted that I would be the one actually getting my hands dirty. He probably thought that my stepbrother or my brother or someone in the family would be doing, you know, this work, but I don't think that he would have thought that it would be me. <laughs> um, now, Mississippi is a long way from Detroit and, and Houston's a long way from Detroit. You know, what, what brought you back to Detroit? You know, me and Priscilla have spent a fair amount of time there. And, uh, you know, it's for environmentalists, this is really a, a very, um, I mean, I, we've definitely experienced a real um, sort of wonderful culture around the people in Detroit. And I imagine there's a certain reason people are drawn to being in that area, but why are you in Detroit? Well, uh, Grand Rapids where I was raised, it was a little conservative and there was just more diversity in Detroit. I've always been fascinated with the culture here. I mean, from the arts uh, to the music, all of the events uh, that were held here. 
Um, a lot of my friends went to Chicago throughout the year when we were growing up. I, I visited Chicago, New York, and Detroit. So I have an affinity and a love for all of those cities, but I fell in love with Detroit at a, at a young age. I remember, you know, seeing the color purple with my my parents here. I remember the African world festivals that we would go to do. And, and, I, and I just figured if I was going to be close to my family and I was actually going to live here, because I thought I would be in the South, honestly, mm -hmm. uh, Detroit was the best city uh, for me personally, um, just because I love, I love culture. I love diversity. And there's just, you know, there's a, a beautiful community of, you know, I call it like gumbo of people. <laughs> you know what I mean? From all different cultures here. You know, it, it seems like there's a real um, pioneering spirit to the people of Detroit. Like they're, you know, the city contracted, but now they're, they're you know, at least my observation was there weren't a lot of fast food restaurants. There wasn't a lot, of, a lot of that kind of stuff in Detroit. It was just the people who were there were people who wanted to be there. They were people who believed in their neighbors. They believed in their you know, their, their blocks where they lived and they wanted to be a part of, of that, that community. Is that what you were drawn to? Absolutely. I mean, one day I'm eating Mediterranean food. The next I'm eating, um, you know, foods from Arabic uh, cultures. And, and then I might be eating, you know, what black people cook. So, you know, at the end of the day, I've always been drawn to a diversity and culture. Um, the pioneering spirit, it, it's unbelievable here. And I think that the world really, you, you got a glimpse of, of actually the culture here in the city and that pioneering spirit. But I don't think the world knows us as the, as a, as the car capital, but there were so many artists, so many inventors. I mean, just an array, a diversified group of people who have been impacting for over a hundred years now, you know what I mean? And so that pulled me in. The, the spirit of the city definitely pulled me in and the people. You know, there's, you know? A, you know, there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, basements that haven't necessarily been filled in from an environmental perspective. You know, how do we, how, how are you thinking about, you know, you're, you're called Detroit Dirt. I imagine you're thinking about the, the entire environment there, but how do we, you know, this is a reclaiming, nature reclaiming a large area and then, you know, figuring out how we live more in concert with nature. You know, oh. how, how are you thinking about it? Priscilla, did you want to say something? Yeah, just, just for those, you know, who are listening and watching, explain, you know, what, what is Detroit Dirt? Why did you start it? You know, and kind of what, what, what you know, so we can give people context. Sure. Um, so Detroit Dirt is a, it's a small composting company um, that's a replicable model. We look at it as, as a model that can be replicated and integrated in any community. We focus on waste reduction and materials management. Uh, the, the, the core uh, focus of Detroit was to divert food waste because we wanted to tackle the food waste issue, but we also um, the Detroit Zoological Society played a key role or their key component in this as well, because we wanted to make uh, compost, uh, soil nutrients and um, things that were just good for, you know, growing uh, as far as mediums for, you know, urban farmers in the farming community, but anybody can buy, you know, Detroit dirt retail or wholesale. So it was a closed loop model that was established about 10 years ago. And the focus was waste reduction, food waste primarily, and um, processing that and making compost. You know, were there a group of, were you, were you already working in nature? You know, what, what was it like before you actually founded a company to do this, you know? Yeah, um, actually, I had a little, I had, I, I purchased, I actually convinced my dad to allow me to buy part of his equipment. So he had some dump trucks, uh, roll off containers. And um, there was a, another gentleman in the, in the city of Grand Rapids who had some of the same equipment sitting idle. And I decided that I was going to try to figure out how to get involved with sustainability from a waste management standpoint, but re focusing more so on recycling. How the Detroit Dirt model came about is when I started bidding on work in Detroit, I met an urban farmer 
And when I interviewed him, National Wildlife had, uh, I was on a project where I was interviewing different folks in the community and I was, lobby I was lobbying a little bit in DC and the urban farming community was just revolutionary to me because it went full circle. There wasn't a, a community for a while and then they decided to reemerge. And what I realized with Greg, when we decided to come together, is that the urban farmers didn't really have a lot of resources. They were trucking material in for 30, 40 miles outside of the city. So we figured, why don't we create some pathways to create, you know, or be resourceful, right, within the carbon footprint of the city. And that's where the model really, I studied, you know, I just focused in on the economics for about two or three years of just saying, okay, how do we change the footprint of Detroit? How do we take the yard waste from the city and the manure from the zoo and food waste from restaurants and whomever and keep those resources in the city, change the footprint, but also have it, you know, um, access for residents or whomever. You know, so, so that's, you know, systems thinking, you know, right. and, 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 you know, there's there's a lot of people who can be environmentalists from systems thinking, right? Very complicated thing to do. You got to be, you know, I don't know which college you went to, but I'm sure it's some very serious college where you learned how to how to do this. You know, um, uh, what about everybody else? What about people who want to be environmentalists and they just feel like it's overwhelming and they can't they they can't do that? You know, what do you what do you can can we all be environmentalists in our own way? Absolutely. I believe that we all are internally, it's within us. Um, even if you live in an apartment and you find yourself just journaling and looking at the food that you're eating, you know, you could, you could buy from a local source. Uh, you could, you know, find the urban farmer who is willing to take your food waste. You can recycle. You know, we're only, you know, with, we're within reach our fingertips of all of us being environmentalists. Um, there, are, there are tons of organizations around the world that are right in our own backyards that we can support or volunteer our time as well with urban farms, gardens. Um, there are a lot of children uh, today, K through 12 schools who have gardens. Um, I think recycling is very important that we need to actually look at our own footprint. You know, if we can walk to a store and you're in a city instead of driving, or take your bike, you know what I mean? Just consider yeah. Yeah. your own energy usage. I think that if we all think about, you know, what we all can contribute, you can either donate to an organization or you can volunteer. You can, you can look up your uh, policy within your city and see exactly what programs are going on and, and get involved. You know, you, you, you make a really important point, but I want to kind of back up a little bit because you really focused on one thing, dirt. And, and that, you know, that, and then so much comes from that, right? So you talk about all these different things that you're doing, you get the manure from the zoo, it's giving back to the urban farmer, you know, and then I've seen you've done animations around this, because there's also a narrative to be told. So you've sort of, how do you think about making this dynamic and interesting, because it's really going to be buy-in from other people. And that's one question. Second question is, has the pandemic, as horrible as it is, helped us to stay put for a minute. And, you know, Jesse and I fly around the world all the time. We don't really, we've been so privileged to go and meet people all over the world, but we haven't been doing that. And, and it struck me like we're not doing that. And so there's good things about that. Can this time help us stay local? So two different right. questions. Right, so the first question about making it appealing and attractive for the buy-in for, for people as a whole, um, I think, within all of our cultures or who we are, um, there's something that our, our grandparents, our great grandparents did around sustainability. And I think it's still within us through legacies of our families. Um, and I think what makes it attractive about sustainability is you can look at it in a broad sense. It's either saving money uh, and wasting less with your grocery bill, um, but from, you know, anything from switching the lights off or not having on the television, you can begin to see the, the differences. But what makes it attractive, I think, now in today, today's society, science is such a complex, um, 
you know, a topic and, and thing. Nature is very complex. And I think what we're starting to do now is a lot of experts, and I don't necessarily consider myself an expert, but I think what's beginning to happen is people are looking at this and they can relate to all of these different models. Now there are scientists who can translate for the masses where it used to be, it seems so far away. Climate was just like this, this huge topic it was so it's so much involved with it from biodiversity to space healthy soils you know air and water quality i think now what makes it appealing is when you have folks like me that are boots on the ground and i can just take a piece of the puzzle and translate that to people and say look you are what you eat um if we divert food waste and recycle it or process it and put it back into the earth where it belongs, we're gonna reduce greenhouse gases. People can relate to simple terminologies and things like that where I think in the past, it was just so scientific. We didn't have a lot of translators of science uh, coming together to, to give a, like a, a harmonious message. Um, and then your, your second question was, let's see, you said, <laughs> Pandemic. Pandemic it was a, and taking a pause. The pandemic, you know. Oh, thank you. That was that was really great to hear your perspective. But you know, we all have to stay home. For a lot of people, have been staying home. Right. This is a teachable moment, honestly, about everything. You know, some some people are saying this is a moment to reboot. Some people say, and really serious scientists say, this is like the environment kicking us in the ass. Like, stop. You know, everybody, just stop. Like. There's too much going on. Any, just any thoughts around how we can use this moment? Yes, um, I look at it as a moment of pause and reflection. Um, I haven't stopped working. The beautiful thing is I get to talk to people like you who um, care about the work and that you're interested in sharing. Um, and I'll give you an example. We know now that a lot of K through 12 students have to stay at home. So we're actually, I was on the phone with one of the founders of GoPro. And so our idea is to use these cameras to bring science home to the, the kids so they can actually, children, they're very, they like textures and they, they like to engage as well. So if they're gonna be at home, we can create these curriculums where they can engage with, with the actual curriculum. I think from a business standpoint and economics, there are so many, I mean, if you look at the TED countdown, you look at S&P 500, all of these major corporations are now looking at climate as a, a topic. It's not just a topic, but it's corporate and social responsibility. And I think right now while we're in this moment, so many of us can read books and get acquainted with what's out there or at least watch movies. I mean, just like the film that's coming out, that is, to me, it's revolutionary when you can now, at your fingertips, technology can reveal so many things to you if you research. And I think with us all being within this pandemic, we can take the time to really learn about it. And we've ex we can see it. I mean, in some countries, third world countries, they actually, their air quality has changed just because there's less traffic and people but we can't stay that way forever. I think what we have to do is learn about who we are as people, but also learn what we need to do collectively uh, because we're gonna, we're gonna be out in the world again. I don't think that we're all gonna, you know, we can't stay in forever. I mean, part of who we are within, you know, our existence is we have to engage, we have to socialize, but I think with sustainability, it just has to become a part of our life. It's a cultural thing. It's just not about, pol we can't wait for the politicians and policy to come down the pipeline. We actually have to look at ourselves as leaders in our own communities and make sure that we're implementing uh, projects and lending a helping hand to those who have been involved with this for quite some time as well. Tell us a little bit about the movie. Oh man. Um, I'm excited about this movie because Kiss the Brown, they really focus in on, you know, policy and um, farming, regenerative practices. 
And so what, what happened was Josh Tical um, and the Kiss the Ground team, they came together to travel around the world to talk to F experts. So soil experts, uh, scientists, farmers, and they're really pushing this regenerative agricultural uh, movement as well as you know, carbon capture and carbon management. And I think it's gonna speak volumes uh, to people globally because when you watch the film, it ties it all in together, air quality, water, a healthy soil. And um, I had the honor of them you know, coming into Detroit and they wanted to talk to me. They flew here and we talked a little bit about the model and the importance and, you know, my message is universal. I feel like there's probably uh, thousands of passions out there around the world who are uh, pushing for regenerative practices, um, no tilling of the soil, uh, making sure you're composting, making sure the food that you're growing is grown in healthy soil. Um, the UN put out a, some, some stats and facts not too too long ago where there's only 60 years of harvest in certain parts of the world on average so some people don't even have topsoil so i think that soil and water to be honest with you we really have to focus and start investing in our soil and our water and i think this the film is going to translate that on so many different levels that what we eat is important you know our soil our water and it's, it's just, it's, to me, I love it because you have celebrities, experts, and people and entrepreneurs who are just speaking from their heart about their, their, how passionate they are about this movement. And it's going to be relatable to so many people. It's not going to be one of those boring science, you know, climate films where, you know, you're, you're listening to a bunch of experts. You're going to hear from some people who are boots on the ground, grassroots, people who have helped their communities recover as well. You know, I love what you said about um, it our, it's in our family. You know, you said your ancestors, your, your grandparents, great grandparents. Um, we've been talking to a lot of people, I think you know this around really the cr climate crisis in the last several weeks. And there is so much knowledge really that is already is empirical knowledge that's been passed down for, for millennia. I mean, it's just, and so that idea of it's kind of a returning to a, a deep listening, uh, a listening of what you may be your ancestors, all of our ancestors were doing. Um, and so how do, you, how do you think about that when you think about the, this idea of, you know, the, just being very sort of in a way simple and sometimes like simplest, simplicity is sophistication. What do you, what do you think about that? And, and being able to return to kind of understand what was working. We say topsoil is only 60 years, right? So what are you, how do you think about that? Sort of going back and getting deep, you know, information. Yeah. So, you know, um, that's a great question. Um, you know, Priscilla, I, obviously there, some of my ancestors were tied to slavery. And I think that there's a lot of negative um, energy and vibes that come along with agriculture, right? We got disconnected because so many were migrating and doing a multitude of things, trying to get away from that. But at the same time, I think all of our cultures, whether you're Jewish, uh, Black, you know, Armenian, African, it doesn't matter, Brazilian, at some point your ancestors were gardening or were in tune with you know, simplicity of life, of, you know, canning food and, you know, making sure you didn't waste anything. And they lived the way that all of our ancestors live as far as budget. You know, a lot of them, they didn't have money to just throw away whatever. And I think that to me, that that's what is in the back of my mind, like that was passed down from generations is, you should be growing something or you should get your hands dirty at times. You, you should look at, you know, farming as an important um, component as to who we are. You know what I mean? And I think that um, the most rewarding for me is getting younger people back in tune with that because so many of them are focused in on all of these different opportunities in the world, but agriculture provides you know, you, 
you can align and learn about agriculture as far as sci being a scientist, a doctor, an environmental attorney, it doesn't matter. I always, when I'm on, on all these campuses, I like to give young people um, a sense of belonging within the movement and getting them to see that, you know, if you learn about climate, then you'll find that your career and climate resilience is all tied together you know what i mean and so i think when the struggle happened to so many of us around the world within our cultures i think that that has something to do with simplicity as well and having an understanding of, of who we are because a lot of us have been through our ancestors have been through the struggle in life and gone through so many different things uh you know from uh, reconstruction to poverty, um, you know, you name it, slavery, all these things have happened. But I think from those detrimental stages and, and throughout history, we were able to learn and sustain from that. And I really think that that's what sustainability really is. I think it can be an abused greenwashing term. But I think most of us around the world, when, if, if we only had a little bit to work with, we would we would make the adjustment <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know you talk about the, your ancestors you know 120 150 years from now you'll have been the ancestor and <laughs> and what do you hope to leave you know future generations um what do you hope that when we say a, you know environmentalism when we say sustainability you know what does that what does it mean for the distant future yeah, um, I hope, my hope and dreams for the younger generations is that this will just be a natural, um, this will be a part of their culture, that, you know, the way they live, how they, their, their homes, how they um, travel, what they eat. Um, I just pray, you know, and I'm hopeful that it's just going to be a, a cultural thing that it, it won't be looked at as like a, a hot topic climate will, will no longer you know that they will actually be taking action and um running all of the things the systems that we're creating today they'll be revolutionized and, and technology will be integrated with it and um they'll be able to sustain i'm not sure the world will look the way that it does today but i think that um these young the younger generation they are excited they're willing to learn about you know the importance of climate resiliency but i would my hope is that for generations to come that they won't have to worry about you know where their food is coming from that they'll understand locally that they can grow and create local economies and that they won't be so reliant on all of these broken systems because within the pandemic, we realized all of these inefficiencies, all these systems, has, they have flaws, they're a void. I think the younger generation, they'll have an opportunity to really um, sustain uh, the right systems. You know, your dad would take you with you when you were with him when he was working, you know, you'd go to the landfill. Did you ever go camping with him? I like, I don't, my dad, I don't know if we went camping. They have a little cottage up north, but I went camping with my friends. I didn't necessarily go camping with my dad, but I were, went camping. Were there things you got from being in nature, you know, when you're not working and thinking about what you're doing? Is there something special that comes from being out in nature? I love sitting by the water. I love being out in the in the woods. My friends and I, we go out and have bonfires and we sit out there and, and it to me is some it's just a beautiful thing, you know. Um the country to me is a way to get back in tune, you know. So I'm always game for, you know, jumping on four wheelers or going, you know, sledding in the wintertime. It's you know, nature to me is just, it's a re, it's rewarding. And I think that we have to respect it more. So I don't make as much time as I, I did earlier on, but I, I get out there a little bit, um, especially just having a nice bonfire and being by the lake. Um, you know, I haven't been camping, but I've done a little hiking and, you know, I, 
I just, nature just has a special place in my heart. So, yeah. You know, one last question for you, because you started about, you know, talking about young people. And of course there was, you know, Greta was doing really coming into sort of known for environmentalism. And then we had the pandemic and then that it did expose all of the injustices that have still been there. And so how do you feel, is there also an opportunity because we know there's a lot of um, environmental injustices. We still have bad water in Flint, Michigan. There's still a lot of things to be dealt with, you know, just from a kind of a social structure perspective. So do you feel like there's, there's you know, the, the, all of the work that you're doing, certainly revitalizing Detroit, but, but the, this message that, and the things that you're working on, they belong to everyone. They belong to everyone. And you just so beautifully talked about your ancestors, you know, had to deal with slavery, had to deal with a lot of things, but how can we reclaim, you know, um, our history, our dirt, the dirt belongs to everyone. And so is there fairness here? You know, it's kind of the last question. Can we make it more fair? Yeah, I love that. Um, absolutely. I think that, you know, climate justice, environmental justice, we all have to come together in order to really improve and impact, you know, on a whole nother level to where we will be able to reverse uh, the climate change or create resilient movements. We all have to come together. I mean, this is the one thing that I love seeing Greta. I love seeing all of these young people uh, stand up and say, wait a minute, I might, you know, not be an adult, but guess what? I, I can, I can make a difference. But I think that, you know, that's what excites me, Priscilla, is the fact that, you know, yeah, I might sometimes be the only black uh, person in a room at a climate event, but the hope that's there is most of the people are like-minded and their hearts are all in the right place. Whether it's a room full of all white people or black or whatever, they're all fighting for the same thing. And that's environmental justice, that's climate justice. And I think that that's the beautiful thing about, you know, you look at throughout history, all of these different movements and, and you know, um, and I, I believe that the industrial, revolution, there's a climate revolution now. And so we can take technology as well as all of the scientific data and experts and start building a whole new world now that to me will eclipse those other revolutions that happen. I think now's the time, you know, to bring all of us together to fight for this. I know why you have your name. <laughs> Because you you lived you lived into your name you you grew into your name. Thank you so much for jumping on with us. Um, I hope we have the opportunity to talk to you also soon, really soon. You'll be you hearing. Will. Yeah. You'll be hearing. Thank you, Passion. I owe you an email too, Priscilla. Yeah. Okay. I'm talking to Jesse soon too. Okay. okay. Well, Bye, take Tasha. care. Good to see you. Keep up the good work. Keep up Thank all that you. work. Bye. She was great. Oh my gosh, she's she's an amazing she's an amazing woman. Yeah. Um, whoa. She just. I mean, she's so incredibly smart and and uh, yeah, doing really really great work. And it, you know, it just can be from one thing that you really care about, something that you have passion about, and from there you can create incredible change. And that's just one piece. She's she's part of a group of people that are just doing things in their own homes, in their own backyards. Um, Wonderful conversation. What are you doing today to make the world a better place? Doing all the work we always do. Okay, that's <laughs> the, the right best answer. I can. Okay, right, I'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Bye.